What's up everybody, Dr. Rossi, Shrinks and Sneakers.com. So because I listen to you guys and your comments and your questions and the things you want to see, I'm going to cover a medication that many people have asked me to cover in the past and it's finally time to do so, and that is Lamotrigine or Lamictal. So this medication is an anti-convulsant mood stabilizer that blocks voltage-gated sodium channels. So we're going to talk about the mechanism of action, the dosing, I'm going to talk about what it's effective for, what it's not effective for, and more in this video. So stay tuned. So I'm going to focus primarily on the FDA approvals here for psychiatric purposes. So the FDA approved Lamotrigine for the maintenance treatment of bipolar 1 disorder, and it's indicated in bipolar illness based on two positive studies in the context of many negative unpublished studies. So believe it or not, the company that makes Lamotrigine or Lamictal, GlaxoSmithKline, they actually didn't release a lot of the data from the studies that were unpublished. So many of these studies went unpublished, but they were negative, meaning that the medication didn't really work for the indications that they were looking at. So I want to clarify a little bit of that here. It doesn't mean the medication doesn't work at all. It just means that really that specific indication for maintenance treatment and bipolar 1 disorder is the main thing it works for. Okay, and I'll explain that here in a second. So, of course, the company looked at all the potential indications that they could get for the medication. And one of them in bipolar disorder would obviously be for the treatment of acute mania. So, Lamotrigine has been proven ineffective two times in two unpublished studies. It's been proven ineffective for the treatment of acute mania. It's been proven ineffective in three times for acute bipolar depression. So there's th two unpublished studies that you could see that were that were where this medication didn't work for acute mania, and then there's three unpublished studies where this medication did not work for bipolar depression. And often you hear clinically, I hear this from psychiatrists all the time and from colleagues all the time that, oh, I like Lamotrigine for patients with bipolar depression. It helps the bipolar depression. Well, the studies and the research would say otherwise. So who knows what that, that process is? Is that just helpful because it's helping with maintenance of bipolar disorder in that patient? Is there some, something else going on? Is it a placebo effect? I don't know, but the bottom line is the data doesn't pan out, okay? So ineffective twice for mania, ineffective three times for bipolar depression. For rapid cycling, that's another one. So rapid cycling means four or more mood episodes in a year. So in a year's time, four or more of these episodes. It's also proven ineffective two times. So it doesn't work for rapid cyclers any better than, say, lithium or divalproix or whatever other mood stabilizing medication you want to look at. So proven ineffective for rapid cycling as well. Essentially, what this boils down to is that Lamotrigine only works for bipolar maintenance. So what it really does is it works for the prevention of mania, the prevention of a new onset manic episode. It doesn't treat the manic episode if it's already ongoing. It doesn't treat the depressive component of bipolar disorder if there's an active depression, if there's a depressive episode going on when the person presents. And it also doesn't work for people who are rapid cyclers. There is a small benefit, so I can't say it doesn't completely doesn't work for depression. There is a small benefit in depression treatment, but it's not clinically meaningful. When you look at the research, when you look at these unpublished studies, what you see is that it doesn't matter and it wouldn't make it a difference in the, in the patient's life if they took the medication or didn't take the medication. And this could be due to a couple of reasons. One thing that people have said in the past is that it might be because the dose takes so long to get up, titrated up to an effective dose, right? So it takes a long time to get to an effective dose, and I'm going to explain more about that in this video, but I wanna focus again on the indications and what this medication actually works for before we get to those other details. There is more benefit for preventing relapse into a depressive episode than a manic episode with Lamotrigine. So again, it can kinda of say like a, a, a patient who's already stable, who's not experiencing a depressive or manic episode, it can help stabilize the patient for a longer period of time and delay the onset or relapse into depressive or manic episodes, and that's where Lamictal shines as a medication. So if you're thinking this medication is gonna help you with mania or acute depressive episodes, then you're incorrect. 
If you think it's going to prevent the relapse into depressive or manic episodes, you are correct and you're using the medication the right way. So I want to talk to you guys a little bit about the mechanism of action. I hinted at it at the beginning of the video, but it acts as a use dependent blocker of voltage sensitive sodium channels. So voltage gated sodium channels are blocked and that's the main mechanism of action. And what you will find is this is very common with a lot of anticonvulsant medications. That's the way they work. It will interact specifically with the open channel conformation. So sometimes they ask you this question, is it an open channel? Is it a closed channel that the medication is binding to? In this case, it's the open channel conformation that it binds to. It interacts with a specific site at the alpha pore forming subunit of the voltage sensitive sodium channel. So probably information you don't need to know unless you're going to be tested on it or unless you're a psychiatrist or a neurologist and it inhibits the release of glutamate and aspartate as well. So two other things that it inhibits the release of. Now you might be asking Dr. Rossi, how long does it take for this medication to work? Well, unfortunately it may take several weeks to months for this medication to work. You, and, and that's primarily because it takes such a long time to get to an effective dose. So it's really difficult to get up to an effective dose and I'm gonna tell you about that in a few minutes. So let's cover the dosage range. So for monotherapy, the usual dose is somewhere between 100 and 200 milligrams per day. So I always tell my patients that I want to titrate you to at least 100 milligrams per day. And if we need to go up to 200 milligrams per day, we will. As an adjunctive treatment for bipolar depression, 100 milligrams in combination with valproate or 400 milligrams in combination with enzyme inducing anti-epileptic drug like carbamazepine, phenobarbital is effective. So if you're using this as an adjunct to someone who's already on uh, valproic acid or valproate, you have to be careful because with valproate, you have to half the dose. So if you're using lamotrigine in combination with valproate, you cut the dose in half. So if you're going a target dose of 200, you need to go 100, right? Um, that would be an example there. Now, if you're using it in conjunction with carbamazepine, which induces liver enzymes, it's going to make the metabolism of lamictal more common or more or more or, or occur more often or faster. Rather, I'm trying to get the right word here. Um, if you're using lamotrigine in combination with carbamazepine, you need to double the dose. So it's kind of easy to remember. If I'm combining lamotrigine with valproate, I need to half the dose. And if I'm combining lamotrigine with carbamazepine, I need to double the dose because it's going to induce the enzymes. Now, the dosing process. This is why it takes so long to get to the proper dose. It, you have to start with 25 milligrams per day for two weeks. On week three, you can increase to 50 milligrams per day. So mind you, your two weeks at 25 is not gonna be effective. Another week at 50 is probably not gonna be effective. And then finally, at week five, you can increase to 100 milligrams per day, and you may have an effective dose at that point. At week six, you can increase to 200 milligrams if needed, but you can see in total, it can take five or six weeks just to achieve a, an, an adequate dose. And at that point, you still need additional time to see whether that dose is going to be effective and, or whether or not you're gonna to have to go up higher to 200 milligrams in this case. So it's significant. So now it's time for me to tell you guys why it is that we have to go so slow with this medication. Why can't we just go up to 50 milligrams? Why can't we start at 50 milligrams and then go to 100 and then go to 200 as needed? What is the big problem? So what are the notable side effects associated with lamotrigine? The first one is a benign rash. And we're going to talk a lot about rash here because it's very important. But a benign rash occurs in approximately 10% of patients. This is a rash that you don't worry about. This is one that doesn't look like a major problem. And I'm going to describe both the benign and the more severe rash in a second. The other things I want you to be mindful of is that there's a dose dependent um, side effect. There's actually a few dose dependent side effects to be mindful of. Some people have blurred vision, some people have dizziness, and some people have ataxia, which would be a lack of balance or, you know, basically a lack of balance, inability to walk appropriately. So blurred vision, dizziness, ataxia are also things that can happen, and they are dose dependent. So again, higher the dose, the more likely they are to happen. You can also develop nausea, which is dose dependent, vomiting, dyspepsia, and rhinitis, and rare but serious risk for Steven Johnson syndrome. So this is the big one. This is why we have to dose this medication so low and go so slow with the titration because there's this risk for Steven Johnson syndrome. And Steven Johnson syndrome occurs in one in 5,000 
using the slow titration. So it's still actually pretty common even for the people who are going slow. And then the other rare thing to be um, mindful of is that it can cause some problems with your blood cell counts, although again, very rare, but could happen. The good things about the medication, before we talk more about the rash, I just want to point out a couple of good things about the medication because I feel like we're talking about all the bad stuff here, is that there's a very low risk for weight gain, which is extremely important for patients, right? We've been talking a lot about weight gain lately, so we don't want people to gain weight. And there's a very low risk for sedation. So people who take this medication are not going to feel sedated or overly tired. Now, if a rash develops, what do you have to do? You have to assess it. And you have to determine, is it benign? So benign rashes tend to peak in 10 to 14 days. They're spotty. They're non-confluent. Non they're non-tender. There's no systemic features like a fever or, ab or abnormal lab results. So the things to look out for is it peaks in 10 to 14 days. It's spotty. It's non-confluent, not tender in any way. And there's no systemic symptoms like fever or problems with your lab results. What you want to do in that case is you want to reduce the lamotrigine dose and stop dosage increases at that point. You have to also warn the patient to stop the medication, seek medical attention if the rash gets any worse. Prescribe antihistamines and topical cortico corticosteroids and monitor closely. So that would be the management. So it would be essentially stop any titrations, keep the person on the dose that they're on, continue to monitor carefully to make sure the rash doesn't get any worse, and then of course prescribe things like antihistamines and corticosteroids, topical corticosteroids, in order to treat the rash while it's occurring so that the person is more comfortable. So symptom management of the rash. However, if the rash is serious, you're looking for the following things. You're looking for confluent, widespread rash that's tender. It often involves the face or head and neck and upper body. It can also involve things like the eyes, the lips, and the mouth. So if you see any rash that's developing eyes, lips, and mouth, you want to be concerned about that. And it, obviously, if the person develops a fever, anorexia, or lymphadenopathy, you want to be worried about it. So fevers, obviously taking your temperature, anorexia being inability to eat and weight loss, and lymphadenopathy would be things like palpable lymph nodes in your neck or face here. If you feel anything like that, you got to start to be worried. On lab results, what you want to look at are elevated liver enzymes and elevated creatinine, indicating some damage to the kidneys and liver. Stop lamotrigine at that point. You should, you should immediately stop it. The person should immediately seek medical attention in the emergency room. They should not wait any amount of time if anything like that develops. And if alproate's being used, obviously stop that as well. And you want to monitor this patient very closely in the hospital setting. Okay, so to wrap the video up, I just want to talk about a couple of additional pieces here. For people who are partial responders, I had already said, you know, you can combine this with Valproate, you can combine this with carbamazepine if needed. You can also add lithium, which may help. You can also add atypical antipsychotics or second generation dopamine blocking medications like risperdone, orlanzapine, quetiapine, zaprazidone, and aripiprazole. Valproate is effective, but you need to use caution, right? Remember I said valproate, cut the dose in half. And for um, carbamazepine, double the dose because of the induction of the enzymes. The only tests you really have to do, there's none that are required, so there's no lab tests or EKG or anything that has to be done before starting the medication. And plasma levels, you might be thinking, well, could I follow a plasma level the same way I do with valproate? You really cannot because the plasma levels do not correlate and there's no established correlation between plasma levels and mood stabilization. So we don't have a number, like we're not looking for 60 to 80 say in like valproic acid or valproate, where we're, we're, we don't have any number. So we don't know how that really guides us in the treatment. So to sum it all up, this medication actually is really great for prevention of mania and prevention of depressive episodes to some degree, more so the mania though. Um, it does have some evidence for the depression a little bit. It's not really that statistically significant though, and not that clinically significant, which is the problem. So it does have some benefits. Obviously, the fact that it doesn't induce any type of weight gain, the fact that it doesn't cause sedation are two big ones that patients commonly complain about when they're taking any type of medication for that matter, especially these psychiatric medications. 
Um, other good things about it is, honestly, the side effect profile, although sounds really scary, is, is actually really good. A lot of the other medications we prescribe have many, many more side effects. And, you know, the things you can see that are absent here are things like um, metabolic side effects, right, which are very common with the second generation dopamine blockers. And m most people, in my experience that I've worked with, do not develop the blurred vision, dizziness, or ataxia. I, I have yet to see that in anyone I've prescribed this medication for, and I've yet to see the benign or severe rash of Stephen Johnson's as well. Although, again, the thing you really want to counsel your patient on and let them know about is this risk for Stephen Johnson syndrome and what to look out for specifically, because that is the stuff that may be very harmful. I'm going to hold the video there. If you guys are enjoying the content, please like and subscribe to the channel. And also, please drop your comments below. I'm trying to get to all of them. It takes me some time, but be patient. I will answer your questions.